So I'm going to move on to a different type of stem cell, and these are the germ cells in the body which are transmitted via um, oocyte and sperm to the following generation. And of course, these cells are ultimate stem cells in that they have to make a whole new individual every generation, so they're totally potent. Uh, so um, I particularly want to focus on epigenetics and the role of germ cells in reprogramming and whether or not epigenetic information in germ cells changes in response to particular um, uh, environmental stimuli. And in this case, I'm going to use the example of drugs. So I guess this audience needs no introduction, in introduction for, for, for sperm and oocytes and their role in transmitting genetic information to the offspring. And this genetic information forms a template, of course, for the whole of life in the, off, in the offspring. However, it's perhaps not as widely known that germ cells also transmit epigenetic information from the parents of the offspring. And this information is critical for proper development of the offspring. This is particularly important to understand, I think, because epigenetic mechanisms are responsive to environmental cues and particular environmental uh, uh, um, stimuli can change epigenetic state in cells. And so whether or not uh, these environmental uh, stimuli can change outcomes in the germline, leading to differences in the offspring is essentially what this talk is about. And it's uh, a, a topic that I think is particularly important in understanding both ev evolution and also uh, disease in humans. So there are uh, quite a number of studies now which indicate that the environment of the parent can change outcomes in the offspring. For example, if you take male uh, rats or mice and you feed them high-fat diet, uh, then the offspring uh, in, in of genetically identical mice differs depending on the diet that you fed the father. And so this indicates that the environment of the parent, or particularly the father in this case, can change outcomes in the offspring. And it's broadly thought that this is due to epigenetic differences in the germ lines that are transmitted, or germ cells that are transmitted. So what is epigenetics? Now I don't really need to introduce it, I guess, now because we've, we've covered this topic in the last few talks. However, um, it's been stated a couple of times today that epigenetic mechanisms essentially stabilise lineage identity of cells or the functional identity of cells. And this is, uh, this is achieved through broad regulation of uh, transcriptional uh, profiles in those cells where the, through switching off genes and switching on genes in a stable way. So uh, if you repress cohorts of genes or you allow other cohorts to be activated, and of course, every cell in the body contains the same DNA, but has many different outcomes in cellular phenotype. And this epi epigenetic mechanisms are largely responsible for those phenotypic differences. So the best described epigenetic uh, modification, I guess, is DNA methylation, uh, which we've known about for some time now. Uh, and this is a change directly to the DNA, a chemical modification to cytosine. Uh, in the DNA sequence, but doesn't change the DNA sequence itself. Other um, epigenetic modifications include histone modifications, and these are chemical changes basically to the histone proteins around which the DNA is wrapped, and, and this uh, then allows the DNA to be packaged in a, either a more, a more tightly or in a more relaxed uh, form so that genes can be either repressed in tightly uh, uh, packaged chromatin or accessible in open chromatin. And so uh, this allows then repression or uh, potential activation of whole cohorts of genes. So the germline plays a particular, um, particularly important role in controlling epigenetic information. Early germ cells form during embryonic development and they form uh, this is a, 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 a essentially a cartoon for mouse, but they form a gastrulation from a number of cells which uh, would otherwise make somatic cells. So the germ cells are set aside and at this stage they contain epigenetic information which is essentially equivalent to their surrounding other, to these surrounding cells. So they then undergo a process of epigenetic reprogramming and this removes epigenetic information that is in these 
uh, progenitor cells and results in a cell that's essentially naive for epigenetic uh, modifications. It essentially has a clean slate on which new epigenetic information can be established. So um, this, this allows then either male programming or female programming in the, in the germline uh, during spermatogenesis or during oogenesis uh, and uh, the establishment of epigenetic or an epigenome in sperm and oocytes which is not equivalent, which is different between the sexes and at fertilisation these differences come together to complement and allow uh, the product, uh, allow the, the functional uh, expression of the male and female genomes and the formation of an embryo and proper development thereafter. So our work really is focused on a histone modifying complex known as polycomb repressive complex 2, PRC2, and this complex is made up of three critical proteins or core proteins, SUS12, Enhancer Resist and EED. So I'm going to talk about e Enhancer Resist and EED today. These uh, catalyze a epigenetic modification known as trimethylated K27, which leads, leads to this compressed chromatin format um, and the repression of cohorts of genes. And many of these genes include uh, transcription factors such as homeobox genes. These changes are mitotically heritable and allow stable, stabilisation of gene expression patterns through time and, and cell function and identity uh, through time. So we want, initially wanted to ask whether um, uh, we could, in, in the developing germline, whether if you alter polycomb function, whether you would then affect outcomes in the offspring. And this would then indicate that there's a heritable epigenetic process that under, underpins some of development in the following generation. So I'm going to get briefly go through some data, and because this is a public forum, I didn't want to do too much detail. Uh, but the first experiment we did was that uh, we had males with mutations in the EED gene, so this is a critical component of PRC2, uh, and we looked for differences in offspring uh, in the following generation using uh, males mated to wild-type females. So the, the, the experimental plan is shown here. We have wild-type females. These females are ma mated to males, which are either homozygous for the mutation or heterozygous for the mutation in, e in EED. So these guys here have sperm which have developed in the absence of any good copies of EED, whereas these guys here have sperm which have developed in the presence of one good copy EED, and we consider these to be re relatively normal control. So these uh, males can uh, produce heterozygous um, offspring in both cases. And so we can compare these heterozygous offspring and these animals are genetically equivalent for EED and uh, we look for differences which we then uh, um, would indicate that the epigenetic state of the uh, sperm coming from the homozygous males is different uh, to those coming from the heterozygous or at least functionally different. So the, this is... Uh, one piece of the data that we have, uh, we did an RNA-seq experiment and a microarray experiment on embryos which we produced from homozygous fathers or hetero heterozygous fathers and we looked for transcriptional differences in these offspring and we found a bunch of uh, transcri transcriptional differences which indicate that um, the outcomes in these offspring are different between the homozygotes and the heterozygotes and that there's a, that polycomb somehow regulates paternal epigenetic inheritance. Uh, and so there's an, at least an effect down the paternal side. So we then wanted to ask whether we could see similar effects on the maternal side. And so we did the same type of experiment, but this time we use a specific model in which we can delete um, enhancer as S2 or indeed EED, specifically in the growing oocyte and ask whether this then uh, affects outcomes in the offspring. Initially, we confirmed that uh, trimethylated K27 is enriched in growing oocytes, and you can see uh, uh, primordial oocytes over here and growing through in, at, at day two. And day 24 here, you can see nice enrichment in a growing oocyte uh, down the bottom. So this is depicted here, 
uh, in, in, uh, through the, the growth of, of our sites for H3K27 enrichment. And when we use a model in which we can in delete Enhancer as S2 in the early growing oocyte, we can see that we can com almost completely block the enrichment of K27 in the growing oocyte. So then the question is, if we, do if we block this process, does this affect outcomes in the offspring? And so the data we have so far is that um, offspring from uh, uh, um, oocytes that lack or are heterozygous for um, enhancer as S2 are significantly different in birth weight, 25% uh, lighter uh, between in, on the extremes of this, and this indicates that there's a maternal effect, at least in the in the oocytes. This actually is not a new discovery, and there was a discovery, this, a paper published uh, 13 years ago from Sarani's lab, and I was actually in the lab when this work was done, uh, that, that showed exactly the same thing. So the data wasn't a surprise for us. We've also done uh, this experiment with EED, and if you want to hear a bit more about that, then you should go to, to Lexi Prokopuk's talk um, uh, uh, on Tuesday, I think it is, at 11.30. So this indicates the enhancer as S2 is a maternal effect protein, which uh, then uh, affects outcomes in the offspring. This is of particular interest because enhancer as S2, of course, is not only expressed in oocytes, it's expressed probably in all cells at some stage in their development, and this regulates K27 methylation and the, and, and the genes which are affected by that epigenetic modification. It's also misregulated in many cancers. So enhancer as S2 is becoming quite a popular uh, uh, gene in oncogenesis. And if you look in PubMed and do a search just in 2016, for an enhancer as S2 in cancer, you'll find are about more than 220 publications just this year alone. There are also has been quite a focus on enhancer as S2 for development of anti-cancer drugs for this very reason. And so these drugs block enhancer as S2 function and offer quite exciting new therapeutic possibilities for patients. Uh, and and um, I think this is going to become or obviously is becoming a big area uh, in, in cancer therapy. One of the targets, uh, uh, or one of the cancer types in which you find uh, excessive amounts of enhancer as S2 is non-Hodgkin's non lymphoma, quite a common tumour. Uh, typically affects uh, people in older stages of, of life, or later stages of life, but also affects a certain number of people of reproductive age. So these patients, uh, some of these patients are now in clinical trial using anti-enhancer as S2 drugs. Um, and, and it's potential, obviously, that this, the, the enhancer as S2 drugs may affect the germline in these individuals of reproductive age. It affect the, just these individuals here affect around 12,000 uh, new cases a year in, in the States, about 1,000 in Australia and 2,500 in the UK. So the question for us then is whether uh, drugs that block enhancer as S2 and prevent the enrichment of K27 might affect the germline in these patients and therefore outcomes in the offspring. And so the first question we asked was in fetal germ cells and these won't normally be exposed to the drug because you're not going to be pregnant um, when, when you take the drugs. But we can see in germ cells at least that we very significantly deplete K27 uh, in the germ cells in a, in a drug a dose dependent way. So if we look at germ cells a bit later, now we're in oocytes, and these are uh, growing oocytes, these have been treated for seven days, um, and you can see a significant reduction, which is quantified here, in K27 over a week of treatment uh, from, from the essentially birth uh, for a week of uh, treatment uh, using the drug. And I'll just remind you that if we knock out uh, enhancer as S2 early in this process, then we completely deplete K27 in growing oocytes. So I guess the question for us and, and, uh, and is whether or not these drugs might uh, uh, lead to changes in, in the offspring uh, that, that are similar to those that occur in mice. 
And so we then want to look at the guidelines for using these drugs in the patients. And this is a summary of one of the, one of the, from one of the studies. Uh, of course, you should not be pregnant when you start the treatment. Uh, you should not become pregnant during the treatment. Uh, and you should not become pregnant for at least 30 days after treatment. However, oogenesis in humans actually takes quite a lot longer than 30 days. And so obviously uh, after 30 days, some of those oocytes may still see the effects of enhancer as S2 blockage and have in, in, um, uh, epigenetic differences. At this stage, we have no idea whether that's the case or not. And so I think at the moment, there's a case for looking at the guidelines of use of um, epigenetic modified drugs, not just those which target enhancer as S2, but other epigenetic modifications as well. Uh, and, 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 and generating guidelines which specifically take into account the possibility that blocking epigenetic mechanisms in the germline directly could affect outcomes in the offspring. And that's essentially where I want to leave it uh, for, for, for further discussion, if anyone uh, is so inclined. Um, just like to recognise the people who did the work, particularly Lexi Prokopuk and Jess Stringer uh, and uh, Kirsten Hogg in my lab, We've done essentially all the work uh, in the mouse models uh, and the drug work that we've done uh, so far and, and, and a number of people who supplied mice. Thank you.